We really had a nice breakthrough around 2012 uh, when I was able to determine the crystal structure of the RSV fusion protein. Xavier Salens, who's our colleague at Ghent University, reached out to him uh, because he was interested in using that protein to immunize llamas. Uh, it sounds weird to say wait with a llama. And because he was able to design specific mutations into that protein, he was able to stabilize it and make it a much better vaccine immunogen. I was snowboarding with my family in Park City, Utah, when I got a call from Dr. Barney Graham and he let me know that he was talking with the CDC and it looked like the virus that was causing pneumonia outbreaks in Wuhan was a, a beta coronavirus. I remember getting a WhatsApp message from Jason saying that there's a novel beta coronavirus in China and that we're going to try and put a rush out and determine the structure and hopefully work towards developing a vaccine. But to be honest, at the time, I, I thought nothing of it because maybe like 40 people had pneumonia in Wuhan. So I didn't think it would become a global pandemic. That's when the rush sort of started. We were getting tons of emails from Barney and Kizzy saying, can we introduce these mutations into the new spike? Can we get the genes ordered? Can we start to express protein and see what it looks like? These molecules are like transformers. They start off in one conformation. When it encounters our host cells, it then undergoes this really dramatic change where it kind of explodes up the top, shoots part of itself into our own cell membranes, and then refolds and bends back around into this other conformation called the, the post-fusion shape. Llamas, in addition to producing more conventional antibodies like you or I would produce, they also produce these smaller antibodies, which are called nanobodies. A full nanobody is about half the molecular mass of a conventional antibody. The reason why that's interesting to us is because it tends to make the nanobodies more stable, and it also tends to allow them to bind into small nooks and crannies that larger antibodies wouldn't be able to access. Basically, an antibody treatment or an antibody treatment could be administered to somebody who is already sick to try to reduce symptoms and fight off infection more quickly. So our plan was to send Xavier prefusion stabilized spikes from SARS and MERS, and then they would immunize winter the llama to try and isolate these single nanobody that was capable of binding many different spikes from many different coronaviruses. And then the idea was to have this one nanobody that we could potentially have on hand, we could stockpile, and it would work against all known coronaviruses, as well as coronaviruses that had not yet emerged into the human population, like SARS-CoV-2. Technically, we did fail at our initial goal of trying to isolate the single nanobody that can broadly neutralize many different coronaviruses. But we're still able to identify the one nanobody that seems to have good reactivity against SARS-like coronaviruses. These are experiments that we've been performing for years now, but because we've been doing them for so long, we've gotten really good at them to the point where a sequence was released online and within weeks we had an atomic resolution structure of that protein, which was then going into vaccine trials. So I think it's an excellent example of why we have to fund basic science broadly and begin researching different pathogens because we don't know which ones are going to ultimately break out and lead to a pandemic. When a pandemic breaks out, that's not the time to start years of research on that pathogen. You need to do it ahead of time.